This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Stella Artois is a perfect beer for celebration. Nothing caps off a big sale, hitting your incentive goals, or a profitable quarter like a round of Stella's. Brewed first in 1708 as a special Christmas brew, today Stella is a gift for everyone to enjoy year-round. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the show designed to bring you workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends. We look for the workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends that are shaping the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace around us. The goal is that something you hear on the show by me, by my guest, in our conversation will make you a little bit better at whatever it is that you do. And the way I think you could be a little bit better as a result of today's show, this evening's show, whenever you're listening to this, is a very lovely Christmas gift. And I'm going to give you some insights into this gift as we go along. Trends. The show tries to identify trends. Here's three real quick that are very prominent in the world that I live. Number one, female protagonist stories. Whether it be on Netflix, whether it be on Amazon, the female protagonist is on the rise. I think very quickly of the Queen's Gambit. I think very quickly of uh, of the fabulous Miss Maisel. A lot of the books, the female protagonist seems to be on the rise. Number two is historical fiction novels that center around World War II. My wife is a big consumer of these types of novels, and there seems to be quite a few of them, many of which have been very good from her, according to my wife's reviews. Number three is the game of chess. You'll recall The Queen's Gambit, if you watched it on Netflix, featured, centered around a female protagonist and chess. I hold in my hand a book by a mobile author named Gabriella Saab. The book is called The Last Checkmate. The subtitle reads, Amid the Horrors of Auschwitz, a Young Woman Plays for Her Life. This is Gabriella's first book. I hold in my hand a first edition. And folks, it's on fire in the publishing world. It's on fire in the book reading world. Book clubs, uh, reviews, etc. are continuing to blow this book up with extreme acclaim. We have in our midst, in our fair town, in our great state, a writer on the rise, and her first book is Killing It. And I got her name, Gabriella's name, from a friend of mine, Greer Myers. Greer's a Greer's a critic. He and I kind of think alike about a lot of things. And when he sat down next to me and says, I got a guest for your show, I immediately took interest. And when he told me about the book, I said, well, I'll see if she is interested. And sure enough, we're going to have her in the studio when we come back from break. You can find The Last Checkmate at any of the local bookstores. You can find them at the national bookstores. You can find it at Costco. But if you're looking for a local homegrown person to support and your Christmas list is not yet done, I want you to go find The Last Checkmate. And you can go to you can go to the Haunted Bookstore down on Dolphin Street. You can go to Page and Pallet over the bay and you'll help a local girl done well. Gabriella may sell the movie rights to this book. She may write 100 books in her life. She may write 50. She may earn royalties for the rest of her life that set her in a beautiful position. But if Gabriella is wondering what to do with that money, if it turns out to be a significant sum or even a modest sum, and she wants to make sure it stays with her and that perhaps her family and her heirs down the road somewhere would benefit from that money, then Gabriella would benefit from contacting the wonderful people at Sander for Wealth. Their role, their job is to help people steward their money well into their future. If this is something you would be interested in talking to Sander for Wealth about them, reach out and give them a call. Sander for Wealth Management. Find it online. They're on Old Shell Road here in Mobile, and you can send them a message or give them a call from the phone number on the web- website. Sander for Wealth Management. Uh, additionally, this is going to be a little bit of a different show because we're going to complete this radio broadcast version of the show. And then we're going to go into extra sessions, if you will, extra innings in the podcast version. 
So if you like what you hear and you want to hear Gabrielle and me get into the weeds about writing, you can find the podcast at whatsworkingcam.com. Download that. You'll find it at all your favorite podcast sites, but you can go to that website where you can hear it or download it or go to one of the other podcast broadcast sites, whatsworkingcam.com. When I come back, Gabriella Saab and I will be sitting down to talk about her first book called The Last Checkmate, and I can't say enough good things about it. We'll be right back. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Now offering the purchase of the Stella Artois Chalice, a beautiful stemmed glass with the Stella logo. The purchase of each Stella Artois Chalice provides five years of clean water for someone in one of 13 developing countries around the world. Learn more at StellaArtois.com. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. I'm in the studio today with Gabriella Saab, and I can't tell you how excited I am to have her in the studio with me because I've read her book, The Last Checkmate, and it was really good. And I want to tell you listeners a little bit more because I didn't expect to read it the way I read it. I started on it. I said I need to become familiar with it as I get her in the studio. But when I got on a plane between Mobile and Atlanta, I kind of thought I'd jump in and out of the book. I didn't put it down. And then I changed planes in Atlanta for a flight to LAX, and I read it the entire way. And then I got into the Uber at LAX and told the driver I didn't want to talk. I'm going to get into this book. And then I checked into the hotel, and I ran up into the room, and I finished it. I read it all in a day, essentially. Gabriella, thank you for your willingness to be here. Welcome to What's Working. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to be here. Your book is Taking the Literary World by Storm. Your publisher has elevated you to the top of their important new authors list. Let's learn a little bit about you, and then let's learn about the trends in the book business. Sounds great. Tell us a little bit about your background. So I uh, grew up in Mobile, Alabama. I went to high school here. I went to college at uh, Mississippi State University. Graduated from there with a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Marketing in 2016. Uh, But writing was always my little kid dream that I wanted to do. So after I finished school, I moved back to Mobile, uh, started working here, toyed around with the idea of um, pursuing a master's or something of that regard in creative writing before delving into the actual world of writing. But I got this idea for a historical novel, and I knew historical fiction was what I wanted to concentrate my writing career in. And this idea just would not leave me alone. And so in uh, 2018, I began working on what became The Last Checkmate. While uh, working locally in Mobile, I teach at uh, Pure Bar Mobile over on Old Shell next to Dewdrop. And so I've been working there for the past couple years and writing this novel. I went to Poland in 2018 to work on some research, came home, cleaned up the story, and then uh, signed with my literary agent, sold the book, and now it hit shelves on October 19th of 2021. Now, you've so- summarized some extraordinary <laughs> things here. You've kind of glossed over them. Let me, let's me let take us back a little bit. Okay. Where was high school? McGill Tulin. Yeah, you were a McGill Tulin graduate. And the Jackets. Uh, and then you went into, uh, what's it, you said Mississippi State, Correct. right? Correct. And don't they have a very prominent literary program, Mississippi State? Don't they have a history of that? They have a decent program. It's more of an engineering vet school. You might be thinking of Ole Miss. Maybe Ole Miss I'm is more about, of the art school. Yeah. But um, we did have a great uh, business program. Business is big at Mississippi State and um, uh, PR, all that kind of stuff. English, it was all awesome. Where did you get your fondness from writing? Where did you realize that there was something about telling stories, writing stories that really motivated you? It was a very prominent moment when I was a little kid. I was uh, five years old, five or six, and I was obsessed with Nancy Drew. I had started reading those mysteries and thought they were the coolest thing. And so one day I decided I was going to write a little mystery like a Nancy Drew book. And so I did. And that was it. From that day forward, I loved writing and did not stop. And so my writing trends kind of evolved along with what I was reading So if I was reading mysteries, I was writing mysteries. If I was reading historical, I was trying to write historical. And so 
just ever since then, it was the thing I wanted to do when I grew up and I just never grew out of that dream. Was there a opportunity at McGill to write? Did you have a teacher or a mentor at McGill or at college that really pushed you? I had a lot of amazing English teachers at McGill and in college, and every single one of them was just so encouraging of my writing because, you know, anytime we got an English paper or something, that was always my favorite thing to do. I loved stuff like that. And in college, there was one professor who um, I had a a couple times. uh, He taught me Shakespeare was the last class I took from him my senior year, my last semester. And every single time I went into his class, he would tell me, if you ever want to switch your major to English, we got a spot for you. Really? (laughs) Yes. And so he was just great. I loved him. So he had a hunch about your talent. (laughs) I think so. Did you ever have a hunch about your talent? I don't know. I don't know if it was so much a hunch that I was any good at it, but just that I knew this was what I loved and what I wanted to make work, if at all possible. So I knew I was going to give it my all and see what could happen. So you've got one book. I love your term, hit the shelf. Is that the, yeah, you've got one book that's hit <laughs> the shelf. Term. And there are, uh, you um, obviously, I would suspect, are a consumer of literature as well. I am. If you could trace another author's path that you could adopt for your own, who would that be? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, There have been so many incredible authors that I have met along the way, either through uh, book signings and author events or through social media or just through their writing that have inspired me. Um, One of those being Ariel Lahan, who um, wrote I Was Anastasia, Codename Helene, a few other novels such as that. And her books are just absolutely captivating. And the things she does with plot and story structure are just fascinating. Um, Kate Quinn is another one who writes a, um, most recently a few books on uh, World War II history, just like I have. And her characters are incredible and just her ability to capture a time and a place and a story. And uh, so their works in particular have been very influential for me. And I just love everything they do. So how many books do they have out? Do you, do you look at a career in the terms of numbers of books? I will be a successful writer if I publish 10 novels, 25 <laughs> novels. Do you think about it that way? Not so much. I think everybody's definition of success kind of ends up being different. Um, for some, you might have one bestseller and for others, you may have a backlist of 10 books, but each one's done relatively well. And so you're doing fine. Yeah. So it for me, I mean, successful author for me is the fact that I made it to the shelf. I think that's incredible and is everything I wanted to do, like I said, since I was a kid. And so just getting to this point, I feel like it just doesn't get any better, but I hope to continue and just keep writing and publishing even more. Who are your colleagues? Who do you talk to about writing books? It seems like there seems to be every niche, every specialty, every artist group seems to have a group of colleagues that they hang out with and share their frustrations with. Yes. Who are your colleagues? So the interesting thing about writing is, especially here, like it was kind of hard for me to connect to other people who were interested in that sort of thing. I had one good friend in high school who was. And so he and I have stayed good friends. But then, honestly, I got on Twitter. And through Twitter, I just found this little, you know, writing niche of Twitter where all these people would talk about their work and what stages of the publishing journey they were on because there were, you know, people pursuing self-publishing or traditional publication. And I joined a group of historical writers. There was an account that um, ran this chat. It's called HF Chit Chat. And I'm now one of the um, co-hosts of that. And so through that, every month they would host a talk about a historical topic or a writing topic and people who wrote in that genre would be able to chime in and meet each other and make friends. And so I met so many great writers who now have books of their own or deals of their own or will be soon. And they have become my critique partners and my beta readers and just really, really good friends. Nice, nice. So there's so much I want to talk to you about in this book and what we're going to do here. And you and I talked about this when we scheduled this is we're going to run this interview for radio. And then if you're listening and you want to get into follow us, because she and I are going to do a little bit of a deep dive in the podcast version after the one hour radio show is over. So I say that only to remind myself, there's 10,000 million questions I have for you, and we're going to get to them all. Excellent. I'm ready. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit. I want to hear the moment that your book showed up in the mail. (laughs) That you opened the box or however it was delivered to you and you pulled, I assume, something similar to what I'm holding here in my hand, which is the hardback version. You pulled it out. Now, you had seen galley copies and things like that. But when the final version arrived, that would be the version that countless thousands of people would buy and see on the bookshelf. Tell me about that moment. Oh, my goodness. It was so surreal. Uh, Like you said, I'd seen the galley already. So I'd gotten those shipped a few months prior. 
And that moment was just all oh, the screaming and the excitement. You can see the video on my social media. It's up on my Instagram. Um, so that was just that, oh, my gosh, this is real craziness. But then getting these was um, it was just a lot more quieter, I guess you could say, just because it was like, wow, this is actually happening. This is the one that's going on the shelf and the one that people are going to read and hold in their hands and I'm going to sign for them and all these things. And so and then it was the hardback version that I'd never seen. It was the finished paperback, which has deckled edges and French flaps and all these things that I love. And um, then there's also a large print version. And so just seeing all three of those editions, seeing the blurbs from the other authors that um, were kind enough to give me praise for the book and just just the beautiful binding and everything about it. It was just like, oh, my gosh, this is what it's all led up to. Authors tend to be fans of not just books, but the, they like to hold them. They like oh, to yes. look at them. And I do. I like to look at the first couple of pages and how it looks and all the technical information in that. And then I thump it with my thumb because it has a good tone to them. So many of them do. Did you have a lot of input in the way this book would show up? I did. Honestly, like for the cover, they asked me kind of what my vision was in terms of colors and other book covers that I admired. And so I sent, you know, pictures for my research trip and just kind of my ideas. But then they put this whole idea together of what the cover ended up being. And I saw that and was like, oh, my gosh, I would not have been able to envision that myself. But now that I see it, like that captures everything I could have wanted yeah. for this book. And um, as far as the interior went, there's little chess pieces as the chapter headers. Uh, they gave me those for approval. Um, same thing with fonts and everything else. So it really was a very collaborative process, which I was very grateful for. So the trends, the show, as you know, focuses on trends. There right. seems to be outside looking in trends uh, in the writing of female protagonists, yes. trends in World War II type of novels. Trends in chess, we can't deny that. Chess, chess seems to be taken it by storm. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about whether you intentionally wrote with these trends in mind, knowing that's what the market wanted these days. Not so much, sort of, just because as a marketing major, you know, I knew I needed to be aware of what was popular on the market right now, just because you want to try to hit that. But at the same time, writing a book takes a long time. So by the time I actually have it ready to potentially sell to a publisher, maybe that trend is no longer as popular. So it's not necessarily going to work out for me. Um, so it was more of me loving this particular trend, being so fascinated by World War II, by women in World War II, and the things they did and the things you don't hear about, and wanting to find some more of those unknown, uncovered stories and bring them to light. When we come back from break, what I want to talk about is the, the topic in the book, the story in the book and how you crafted it and how it goes into a flashback mode and then a forward mode and how you had to, I suspect, really organize your <laughs> thoughts carefully to make sure you knew what, where, what timeline you yes. were writing in <laughs> and the talent that that took. Folks, the book is called The Last Checkmate. The subtitle, Amidst the Horrors of Auschwitz, A Young Woman Plays for Her Life. Gabriella Saab, remember that name, folks. And if you want to go online and see if it's any good, check out the reviews. And let's face it, this is an absolute perfect Christmas gift. And the local bookstores are treating this woman very well. They know who they have on their hands. We'll be back after this break. You're listening to What's Working. My family, Turn to the Experts is more than a tagline. It's a promise. Every key technician is an experienced AC professional, and that saves you money. Speaking of money, how about 0% financing for up to 60 months on installations of new carrier systems? Keith and Carrier, Turn to the Experts. Mobile's leading name and comfort since 1964. License number 83731. sitting in the studio with Gabriella Saab. I'm holding her book, The Last Checkmate. It's a story of a female. Well, you know what? You tell me the story. <laughs> I've read it, but I want you, I want to hear you talk about I it. I will. So The Last Checkmate is the story of a girl named Maria, who is a member of the Polish underground resistance in occupied Warsaw and an avid chess player. And when she is caught working for the resistance, she and her entire family are sent to Auschwitz 
where the camp deputy discovers that she plays chess. So rather than executing her, he spares her on the condition that she will play chess to entertain him and the other camp guards. And once he no longer finds her useful, he will then execute her. So she plays chess in exchange for her life and fights for justice for her family. Yeah, and does so very well. And there are a lot of plot twists and there are other female uh, protagonists, let's say, that help her out. Do you know how to play chess? I know a lot more now. Yeah. Um, this was actually a character thing, which is so weird to hear people talk about. Like I used to hear authors say, oh, the character did this and that. And I'm like, really? But you developed them. Like, why are you not telling them what to do? But they really do become their own people, which is fascinating. And so as I was kind of discovering who Maria was and what she likes and doesn't like, I just kept hearing this very loud chess in my head. And I needed a way to kind of incorporate all these ideas I discovered through my historical research um, and bind them together. And I realized that that was going to be the vehicle that was going to kind of hold this whole story and carry it through. Yeah. And so uh, what did you do when you saw the Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit, come out? Did you go, oh, my goodness, were you angry? Were you excited? Did you think this is going to support me or people aren't going to want to read mine because we've already got a chess themed uh, uh, show going. I was honestly so excited. Like I texted my literary agent and we were both like, this could be really good for us. And uh, cause we never really saw it as competition per se, but more of something to get people excited about chess and to show a different side of chess and women in chess that you wouldn't necessarily expect and show also how that can be interesting because you think of chess and it's not necessarily the most exciting thing you'd want to spend your time doing. But I feel like the Queen's Gambit showed how it can be. And so I hoped that that would translate to an interest in chess and those kinds of stories and then ultimately to my story. You said something a moment ago that I find fascinating with authors, and that is the characters take on a life of their own. Yet they are they have been created and they are born out of your hand or your fingers on the keyboard to the authors, and I had Watt Key in that chair right there. He's, he's a, one of the local guys done well in the writing world. He said the same thing. <laughs> he said, I wish I knew my character. I wish I had a friend like the character that I've created right. because they are interesting to them. They create a life of their own. Talk to me about what happened to Maria that was a character development that you didn't expect. Ooh, that is a good question. Uh, definitely how prominent of a role chess was in her life, because as I said, that was something that she brought to me. And I was like, OK, you know, that's a fun hobby. That's great. But it was no, this is like everything she lives and breathes. And so that was very fascinating to me, not being a chess player. Like I know how to play. I can get through a game. But the experts at chess know all these different strategies and they study grand masters and all these things and just have such a fascinating way of looking at the game and of strategizing and of playing that is so different to just a casual chess player. Mm -hmm. So that was fascinating for me to dig into how that would affect her and the way she thinks and the way she acts and views the world and herself in it. So I um, looked up a lot of women in chess and chess during this time in the 40s and the 30s and uncovered Vera Minchik, who's mentioned in the book. She was the first women's world chess champion and is the longest reigning uh, champion with a 17 year title and is kind of a hero for my main character. And so I studied a lot of her games to learn how she played and how she approached it because they all have different approaches. Some are aggressive, some aren't. So I needed to know that about Maria as well. But it was very, very interesting to get into that side of her. Did you ever write anything that Maria did or said and you said to yourself, wow, I didn't expect her to do that? There were some times she, she can be a little reckless in the book. So there are times where I'm like, maybe you shouldn't do that. But she just plows forward and is going to do what she wants. Um, so there were definitely some surprising moments for, for her and for all the characters, especially her two close friends, for those who haven't read the book, she has a mentor within the resistance named Irena, who is a girl a couple years older than her, who is tasked with teaching her what to do. And then when she gets to Auschwitz, she meets a young Jewish woman named Hanya, and uh, who's also a little bit older than her and is a widow. And the two of them are the two of those characters also just became very, very real for me and yeah. did a lot of things I not necessarily would have expected. So you mentioned that she met a young Jewish woman. This is a story about a Christian in the in the, in the in Auschwitz. Did you and, and there's multiple questions here. You did a lot of research. You've referenced that. Uh, how long is it is it possible for you to say for every minute I spent writing, I spent blank minutes researching? 
Not necessarily because, you know, there might be one line in the book that's got a research, I mean, a historical tidbit in it that I spent four hours looking up just to be able to write that line that way, you know. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint the ratio of writing to research because some aspects of the book required more, some required less, some ended up taking me longer or being more difficult for me to find and others were easy. And so it was just a very collaborative process along the way. How did you do the timeline? We talked about that prior to the break. It's flashback. It's flashback er. It's flash forward. (laughs) Did you write each time in sequence or did you write it the way it reads? I actually wrote it in chronological order because I initially had planned to tell it that way. And then when I was seeking literary agent representation, um, basically how that works is you submit what reads like the back of a book um, and then you submit a full synopsis and then sample pages. And if they like that and they read the whole book from there, then they have the opportunity to offer to work with you and you decide if you want to work together. Um, So I had a literary agent respond to my full manuscript with what's called a revise and resubmit. And she said, I really liked these aspects of the book. These are the things I would want to see differently if I were to potentially work with you. And one of the things she suggested was a nonlinear timeline like it is now. And it was something I considered because Ariel Lahan, who I mentioned earlier, um, writes all her books that way. And I think it's incredible and so gripping. And this agent didn't tell me exactly how to do that. So I came up with the idea to take it to the very end of the story in 1945 When Maria is returning to Auschwitz to face Fritsch, her camp deputy, for one final chess game to get all these answers she's been seeking these past four years and then to do that flashback segments like you talked about. And luckily, I already had an outline because I am very much a notes and outline kind of person. So to structure it this way, all I had to do was go into my outline and find those cutoff points where I was going to insert what I call the present scene of this last chess game between them figure out something that would happen that would trigger this flashback and then insert those chapters and just keep moving back and forth and just adjust my transitions and things like that. Is that literary agent who made that suggestion now your literary agent? It is not. I ended up signing with a different agent. After you did all that work. I did. You yes. signed with a different agent. I did because I then submitted it, this new version out to some people, including that agent. And um, once I ended up with the offers of representation, then you kind of decide who you think is the best fit. That's interesting. When you got this suggestion, did you go, oh, man, (laughs) I I thought this thing was cooked. I thought it was done. Now I've got to spend another month, two months. I don't know. How long did it take to redo it? It took me a whole summer, three months. And that was interesting because I thought, okay, this isn't going to be that bad. I already have it written. I just have to rearrange some chapters and adjust my transitions. And that's not too hard. But once I did the restructure, it showed, you know, some other areas of the manuscript I could change or strengthen and just ways I kind of wanted to adjust the story. So at first, it's kind of like, oh, great, I have to edit again. But on the flip side, I love editing and I love just the whole process that goes into writing. And so once I get something like this with an interesting edit that I'm excited about, then I'm really, really ready for it and excited for it. So it did take me that whole summer But it was a lot of fun and a much stronger book for it. The hardest thing that I had to do was change verb tenses because I'd written it all in first person present. And then when I did this flashback sequence, I changed the flashbacks to past tense. No kidding. That was awful. Tedious. (laughs) I spent an entire weekend for like 12 to 15 hour days just changing verbs. How many times do you think you've read your own book? Too many. (laughs) (laughs) So many. (laughs) One on your website. You have a page that says the last checkmate content warnings, Yes, content warnings, and there must be 20 some odd (laughs) content warnings here. In fact, in order to print them, I had to shrink them down to a smaller size (laughs) font. They include tattooing for the purpose of incarceration and dehumanization, discussion of conception through rape, mild burns. There was a tragic, just a tough scene to read of of cigarette burns, pro-Nazi rhetoric, Were you advised to put these content warnings out or is this something you chose to do? That is something I chose to do. It's something that's becoming a little more common in the industry on author websites. It's not required. My publishing team did not tell me to do it, but especially with a book set during this time covering these topics, the World War II and the Holocaust and concentration camps and all these things are very sensitive, heavy topics and very personal to lots of people. And so I just wanted to be very upfront for anyone who was interested in reading it, but maybe apprehensive about what exactly it was going to cover, because the last thing I would want would be 
for somebody to go in and come across something that ended up being triggering and then, you know, cause harm to them or to their mental health. And so I just wanted to be a forward and be upfront in the way that wasn't going to spoil anything necessarily for readers, but also just make them very aware that this is a book that I did not want to sugarcoat. I wanted to be very real about what this experience would have been like, but also very aware of how that might affect my readers. So there, there are some tough scenes. There's yes. not a tough scene. There are There's many tough scenes in this book. And I want to talk about where you had to go to, mm -hmm. to conceive these scenes. Yes. Uh, did you, I know you toured Auschwitz. I want to hear about that. Yes. But did you get the, uh, the ideas in your tours or do you make these types of things up? There's some brutal stuff. And I want to know how you had to keep yourself centered as you write this type of stuff. And we will talk about that after the break. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. Put this on your to-do list, people. It's called The Last Checkmate. The author is Gabriella Saab. She's sitting in the studio here with me today. She's one of our own. She's an Alabamian. She's a Mobile girl. She's a McGill Tulin graduate. And we will continue to hear her name. I promise you this. We'll be right back. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Stella Artois is a perfect beer for celebration. Nothing caps off a big sale, hitting your incentive goals, or a profitable quarter like a round of Stella's. Brewed first in 1708 as a special Christmas brew, today Stella is a gift for everyone to enjoy year-round. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. Hey, this is Cam. Thanks for listening, and I hope you're really enjoying the podcast. Do me a favor and search for Cam Marston on your social media outlets and like us or follow us or whatever is the right thing to do. Also, if you know others who'd benefit from the podcast, please forward it on to them and encourage them to listen. If you're so inclined, we'd love your rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Those ratings matter. Finally, don't be a stranger. Email me with your comments, your feedback, your thoughts, your show ideas, whatever. Cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. I'd love to hear from you. Again, thank you very much for listening. Now, back to the show. Gabriella Saab is a name you're going to want to listen. Uh, remember. Her book is called The Last Checkmate. You can find it anywhere, but hey, let's give a shout out to the locally owned bookstores. There's a haunted bookshop over down on Dolphin Street, not far from where we're sitting. And then there's Page and Pallet over in Fairhope. Are there others that we should mention locally? Those are the two locally owned. Um, otherwise, uh, the brick and mortars, uh, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. That's it. Yeah. And you can get it brought to you by that big box company out of the sky. And Costco. And what about Costco? Costco's carrying it, it as is, well. It is, which is fun. <laughs> that is fun. So we were talking prior to the break about the the brutality in the book, the toughness in the book, and how you got into that space to write it without letting it harm you personally. Tell me a little bit about that. It was difficult for sure. Um, the great thing about my research, I guess great is not the right word, but the most helpful thing in my research was the fact that there are so many survivor testimonies out there that I can read or listen to someone discuss their experiences. So I immersed myself into that, into trial transcripts from Nuremberg and all these other trials and just tried to find everything I could from people who lived it and experienced it. And so a lot of those difficult scenes were either straight out of a survivor testimony or heavily inspired by them. Like I found survivor testimonies from Paviak prisoners who talked about, you know, these prisoners would wait for their interrogations and there would be doors and windows open so they could overhear the torture that was going on in the room next to them and things like that that I never would have necessarily thought of and, you know, felt I needed to include to, you know, lend authenticity to this book. So there was that and then just different things that happened to resistance members, to people in Auschwitz. And so a lot of that did come from those places and just from the characters themselves and who they were. Uh, Carl Fritsch, the camp deputy, was a real man who was known for physical and psychological torture. And so I as I got to understand him and the way his mind worked, that kind of 
lent a lot to his interactions with Maria in particular and what the kind of things he would do and the ways he would try to get into her head and, you know, torment her. And so for me, I did have to get to those places and understand everyone in the scene, no matter who it was, because I equate it very much to acting where it's just a very immersive process. And you, as the author, have to know not only your main character and where their head is at in this moment, but also everyone else playing against them. And so to do that, I did have to go to a lot of these dark places and discover a lot of this history that was real and immerse myself in it and in images of the camp and of survivors, and just everything that happened there. And so then I had to balance out with a lot of self-care. Honestly, I was reading very lighthearted books at the time, like fiction, just like, you know, things I loved as a kid, like A Wrinkle in Time and just, you know, stuff that had nothing to do with this subject matter. I was watching a lot of reruns of Friends and things like that just to kind of get out of that headspace because it was difficult. Like by the end of the day, like if I'd spent all day in these kinds of scenes or on this kinds of research, I would, you know, go talk to my mom and she would look at me and be like, why do you look so upset? And it was just because I'd spent so much time in that headspace. I want to hear perhaps this is for the podcast version, the extended version, which, by the way, if you're just joining us. I'm with Gabriella Saab. We're talking about her first novel, The Last Checkmate. Mine says first edition in it. I'm very proud of that. Um, and then we're going to extend this conversation in the podcast version. If you want to hear that, go to whatsworkingcam.com where you can find a link to this to this interview as well as the one we're going to use to extend it. Um, I'm wondering if you know, there's a great joke that musicians tell that they say to their parents, when I grow up, I want to be a musician. And the parents reply, I'm sorry, but you can't have both. <laughs> Did you, were your parents always supportive of this novel effort? They honestly were. They really, really were. They were very supportive um, of my passions for reading and for history and all these things. Ever since I was a kid, um, they were, you know, letting me read and write and get books and just immerse myself in that world. And then as I got into the actual writing as a career, they were very supportive, very encouraging. And so I was just very lucky. Yeah, no kidding. So let's talk about you wrote this first person. It's I not did. it's very un in my opinion, I don't read a lot of fiction, but mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of that. Why did you choose that? I did it just because I felt it would just make the story that much more impactful if you're not only reading about a girl who is fourteen at the start of her timeline, eighteen by the end go through these experiences. And this just is a very, very intimate way to read a book and to write a book because you are right there in her head, witnessing and feeling and experiencing everything as she would. So I felt it was just kind of that necessary connection that this story needed to the reader. Yeah. And it, it reads very uh, compelling way. As soon as I got into it, I thought, no, this is interesting. I didn't expect <laughs> this. This is interesting. Let's see how it holds up. And yeah. it held up very well. well good. Now, um, as I talk to other authors, they'll often tell me that the first books are often somewhat autobiographical. You write what you know. Mm -hmm. Please tell me <laughs> that the brutality in this book and the and the and the toughness in this book is not autobiographical. That, Can you comment on that? <laughs> that is not, thankfully. But I would say there is definitely some truth to that. You do write what you know in a sense. But uh, so for me, for this book, it was. Maria and her faith. Uh, I'm Catholic. She's Catholic. So that I knew I could lend a lot of authenticity to her family life. They're all very loving, very supportive, very close. All of that was very, you know, personal to me. The fact that she's got younger siblings. I, I have one older brother, but there's a big gap between me and my younger siblings. And so that kind of big sister role that she has is personal to me. And then just how close she is with her friends and her female friends that she makes along this journey. All of that was very um, important to me and something I wanted to capture um, and just little things I could use from my life to insert into her. But she is definitely her own person and her own character in yeah. that sense as well. <laughs> so there are some autobiographical, but not the dark places that we're not reading the dark here. places. And even the autobiographical stuff, like it's never exact necessarily to me because, you know, the character's not you, you're not the character. So it's not going to be quite exactly the same, even if it's something that I can lend authenticity to her experience is still different than mine. So it's not going to line up exactly right. When did you know you needed to visit Auschwitz? Oh, right away. Really? I knew right away because when you have all of that history that still exists and is right at your fingertips, if there is any possible way for you to get there, you would be crazy not to. And I just felt 
if I was going to do justice to this history and to the story, I had to do everything in my power to get over there. So you've got a manuscript in process and you've got no revenue from the manuscript at this point. I'm guessing you don't have representation. You don't have an agent. Yet you somehow scrounged together the money to get a plane flight over to Warsaw, mm-hmm. where I know you toured, according to the, the tail end of the book. Yes. Uh, and then spend time in Auschwitz. I'm guessing you were there 10 days, something like that. It was right at a week. It was right at seven days. Yeah. And y- y- that was a gamble. It was. <laughs> Tell me about that. Tell me when you finally said, I got to find the money to get over there. Yes, you've got a, a job. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, there's there was a, a risk and yes. an investment. Tell Absolutely. me about that. So I started the book, like I said, in early 2018, in January. I finished the draft in May, and that whole time I was thinking, I got to get over to Poland. And so planning, saving, all those things. And then we get to the summer, um, and I was talking to my parents about it and saying, I'm going to go to Poland, you know, later this summer. And my sweet dad was like, you're not going over there by yourself. I'm going to come with you. And so... He and I planned this trip for August and I had the draft written, as you said. So I knew everything that happened, everywhere I wanted to go, everything I wanted to see, because that was important to me because I was afraid if I went before it was completed or, you know, minus edits, obviously. But I didn't want to go over there and then come home and change something and realize, oh, I should have gone to this place and I didn't. And now I'm back and I can't go back. And so. I had the bones of the story and everything that was going to happen and planned out my itinerary accordingly. So every single place I mentioned in this book in Warsaw and in Auschwitz is somewhere that I went. And it was just the most incredible, humbling experience. And I learned so much and so many things that I would not have gotten from anywhere else. And so, yeah, it was just very, very important to me to get over there and to see these places for myself. Is there a service that they offer, they being the historical keepers of these places that says, oh, we've got an author coming in who's going to help us tell our story. Let's make sure she gets what she wants. Were you able to communicate with someone in advance what you were looking for? Or were you just an anonymous tourist just like I would have been? I was mostly an anonymous tourist. Every now and then I would ask something specific because the... Auschwitz Memorial Museum and the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., they are very, very great places and just have so much research on their fingertips. So I could like message them online and say, I'm working on a novel. I have this question. Do you have anything? I'm having trouble finding an answer. Can you look up in your archives and see if you can help? And so I had done some of that kind of email correspondence uh, to answer a few things. But in terms of actually visiting I didn't show up saying I've written a book and that's why I'm here. I just wanted to go in as a tourist. I did ask questions that were specific to me, but I didn't really bring the book up at all. So if I were to take this book and try to lay it out on a map, you know, Mm -hmm. using paper, is the footprint of Auschwitz closely mirrored in the book? Yes, I kept that as close as possible and as accurate as possible. So hopefully it looks the same. But yes, in terms of where all the blocks are, Everywhere I have Maximilian Colby, who's a character in the book. Everywhere he lives was actually a block that he was imprisoned in. Everywhere uh, Viltold Pilecki, who's another real person in the book, everywhere he worked was somewhere he actually worked. And um, so I did try to insert as much authenticity as I could in terms of, you know, whose prisoner numbers are whose. All those are accurate to them as a person, if they were a real person, or to the time and the date that they would have been sent there to um, that imprisonment date. Good on you, man. You really (laughs) did your work. I tried. (laughs) We're coming to the close here, and then we'll get into the podcast version. And I want to talk to you about Father Colby. Yes. Uh, When you decided that he should be in the book, that's that he's a He's a Monsignor, is that right? He's a, he's a priest, Franciscan friar. Franciscan, Franciscan. We'll talk about him when we get back from break. But prior to this, what's next for you? Real quick. Ooh, uh, new books. So I've got another one done and another one in the works. And so we'll see what happens. So you're busy (laughs) promoting this one. You finished your second one and you started on the third. Correct. Female protagonists? Always. (laughs) Always. (laughs) Chess a theme? No, not this time. World War II. World War II and Russian Revolution for book two. My interest is peaked. <laughs> Gabriella Saab. The book is called The Last Checkmate. I promise you, and I don't glow. I don't glow like this for people very often. <laughs> we will know her name in our on our and be proud of her as a part of our community. Again, the book is called The Last Checkmate. If you're wondering what to get that certain person for Christmas, go pick this thing up. And the woman is easily accessible locally. I probably shouldn't say this. 
But maybe you can arrange to get a signed copy from her. Maybe so. Maybe so. We'll be back after this break for final comments. We will continue this conversation in the podcast version. If you want to hear me get into the weeds with Gabriella on her writing style and other things like that, find it at whatsworkingcam.com and we will pick it up in just a second. You're listening to What's Working. This is Cam Marston. The Keith family has provided service to my heating and cooling system since my family and I moved into our home 12 years ago. And today, Keith Air Conditioning offers 0% financing for up to 60 months on new installations, making a new heating or cooling system for your home even easier to come by. Give them a call or find them online and let them come work their magic. Keith and Carrier, turn to the experts. Hi, I'm Chef Jewel at Fairhope Chocolate. When I'm not creating the best couverture chocolate creation south of the Mason-Dixon line, I'm listening to What's Working with Cam Marston. Now, back to the show. I love the artists. I love them. I absolutely love them. And it's maybe because I wish I were one myself. Maybe it's because I wish that I could write this book that I hold in my hand myself or something remotely similar to it. So when I have the writers in the studio for what's working, I'm always a little bit I'm I'm excited for every guest, but I'm different excited for the artists, for the writers. We have had musicians in, we've had singers, we've had different writers, uh, we've had ballerinas, we're going to have a ballerina or two on the show, I'll give you a heads up about that, uh, in the high arts, but I just love them, I love the artists, because, and I don't know exactly how to say this, and I couldn't even really defend it if you asked me to, but the artists seem to capture the soul of the society, and I don't know what that says about this book, The Last Checkmate. What part of our soul is being captured by The Last Checkmate? I don't know. But the artists see things differently. They're able to do things differently. They capture the soul of our society. And in our fair community here, in our great state, we've got a woman who is on the brink of an incredible writing career. And I can tell you, after spending some one-on-one time with her before and after the show, a deep sense of humility, a deep sense of gratitude, a really uh, a, a woman who is truly enjoying and appreciating the the results of her hard work. There's no ego. There's only a lot of fondness uh, that I have for her. And I will be a, a great champion of hers. I'm so grateful she was willing to come on. If you want to hear us get into the weeds about some of the things uh, of writing, then go find the podcast version of this show at whatsworkingcam.com, where she and I get into some of the more esoteric things of writing. I ask her things like, so I w- walk into your writing space What does it look like? Is it neat? Is it organized? Is it not organized? I talked to her a little bit about how she formatted some of the characters and when she knew she needed a character to do one thing or another, a little bit more about her future and things that are going on. So we get into the weeds of the the conversation. If you're a fan of writers, if you're a fan of the writing process, if you want to know a little bit more about this book before you sink your teeth into it or consider buying it, then go to the podcast version of this show where we get into some of that detail. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting this young lady and I wish her the best. And that'll wrap us up for this week. You can find us on social media and I hope you will do so. We're on the all the ones that you would normally expect. Click, highlight, whatever you know, normally do. Reach out, cam at cammarston.com. The show is produced by John Thompson. We'll have another show next week. Have a good week. Okay, Gabrielle. That was the radio version. Awesome. We're now no longer under the domain of the Federal Communications Commission. <laughs> we can speak a little differently, not okay. that we would, <laughs> but we don't have to worry about the timer anymore or mm. breaks like this. Um, so I have always been a great fan of writers. I've told you that during the radio version. I had Watt Key in this studio. He's a local boy done good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I... Tell me how you, so Watt told me every day he tries to get at least 500 good words. <laughs> what is your goal for writing every day? Honestly, it depends on the day and where I'm at in a project. So for me, it's not quite X number of words a day or this or that or the other. It depends on my day job schedule for one thing. 
And then, uh, like I said, just where I'm at. So for me, if I can just make some sort of progress, um, then that feels like a good day. So yeah. if it's edits, um, get through a certain number of edits. That's great. If it's writing, I really don't ever have a set word count for the day, but just get through a point, get to the end of a scene to where I feel like I've done my job that day. And some days that's, you know, 3000 words or more. Other days it's 300. So if I were to step into your writing environment, where, how is it laid out? Tell me what it looks like. So I have the desk I have had since seventh grade and my desk is there. I've got research books all over creation. Um, I've got my laptop. I usually have coffee, Diet Coke, something caffeinated. And I just kind of sit and I write. I don't really write to music or anything. Every now and then I'll have it on in the background, uh, just low to kind of block out noise. But um, that's usually where I write. I write at all hours of the day. I tend to do very well at night just because my brain likes that time of day. So you might find me at 3 a.m. in the dark with only my computer on, just sitting there drafting a new chapter. Yeah. Is it tidy? <laughs> Do you keep it neat or is it? Not so much. Um, some of it, aspects of it. But for me, um, I'm very organized in terms of my process. Like I have to have notes on all my research. I have to have an outline. I have to have all my character development done ahead of time before I write a book. But I'm probably going to have this book open on the floor and this you know notebook over here and this paper that I jotted an idea on over here. So it's not necessarily the most tidy of spaces. Could you ever write plain Super, uh, plain fiction, historical fiction. It sounds like where your 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 passion is. Yes. Could you sit down and write a story from scratch with characters that don't exist, that aren't based on true events or anything like that? I think I could, but I don't think I would have as much fun as I do with historical fiction oh, really? because I love taking what actually happened and putting a fictional spin on it and inserting my fictional people into that world, and just the fact that it's another time and place. Because if I were to write general fiction, women's fiction, whatever it is, that's set in the modern day. And I already live here. I don't want to be here. I want to go somewhere else and do something different that I might not necessarily have thought of before. And so even though I enjoy, you know, good women's fiction here and there in terms of my writing, I just love getting to dive into these other places and time periods and uncover these things and write either fictional people based on these real things that I've discovered or just come up with something entirely new to insert into an actual scenario. When did you, I want to get back to Father Kolb. Yes. When did you realize that Maximilian Kolb needed to be in the book? He was actually where the idea started. So Maximilian Kolb has always been one of my favorite saints. Let me connect my pr pronunciation. Is it Kolb? Yes. Okay. Maximilian Colby, Father Maximilian Colby. Please continue. Right. Yes. So he has always been one of my favorite saints, like I said, because World War II history has always fascinated me. And I've been Catholic my whole life. So uh, that he kind of is the marriage of the two because he lived in during that time and died during that time and was a Franciscan friar and priest. So I always thought his story was so interesting and so fascinating. And this book just kind of started out as the idea of this girl in the concentration camp with him. And this girl was very close with him, very attached to him. And I could just kind of feel that in this idea that just kind of came to me one day. And so I knew he was imprisoned in 1941 and Auschwitz did not become an extermination camp or a camp where anyone other than men were imprisoned until 1942. So the fact that this girl was in this little idea that I had made me think, how could I come up with a way for her to be imprisoned at Auschwitz and not executed? And why is she so attached to Maximilian Colby? What is it about him that she's clinging to? And so that is where this all started. Tell us about his canonization and who was there. Yes. So he was uh, died in Auschwitz. For those who don't know his story, that's not really a spoiler. But um, he was canonized in uh, 1982 by Pope John Paul II, who was a Polish pope. And at the canonization was a man named Franciszek Gajowniczek, who was a also a prisoner from Auschwitz. And in 1941, a man from Franciszek Gajowniczek's uh, prison block escaped. And when a prisoner escaped, those who were left behind uh, were punished for it. So if you got out, everyone else who lived in your block was going to be penalized in some way. And so Carl Fritsch, the camp deputy, selected 10 men from block 14, this block that he lived in, to be sentenced to immurement, which was uh, confinement and starvation in Block 11. and That word again? Immurement. I didn't know that one prior to reading this book. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's a new word for me, too, prior to research. But um, 
So Franciszek Gomniczek was chosen as one of those men to die. And he begged for his life, said he had a family and a wife and was, you know, wanting to survive for them. And so Maximilian Kolbe, who had not been chosen to die, stepped out of the ranks and offered to take this man's place. And so Fritsch permitted the change, which was also surprising because he easily could have said, both of you are yeah. going to go. Yeah. Or he could have said no. But he permitted the exchange. And Maximilian Kolbe uh, passed away two weeks later on August 14th. And so... That was in 1941. So in 1982, in October, he was canonized and Franciszek Govnicek was present at this canonization, which is crazy. No kidding. So amazing. No kidding. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Your Catholic roots, how important were those in this book? Very important because Poland was predominantly Jewish and predominantly Catholic. And so I knew Going into this, that the Jewish story was not mine to tell. That is for all of those who are of that faith and who have, you know, closer ties to that experience than I do. I can lend far more authenticity to that than I could. So I knew I wanted a Polish protagonist who was Catholic because, as I said, that was the other major religion in the country at the time. And I knew from my own faith and my own experiences that I could tell that story. So it was very important to me. Very influential in just the way these characters interact with one another. And, you know, not every Catholic or every Pole was as welcoming it to helping the Jews because a lot of them blamed the Jewish people for what was happening. Even if they didn't agree with the persecutions that were being imparted upon them, they would say, you know, we're thinking it's your fault that the Nazis invaded and now we're suffering because of it. So they were very angry as well. But not every Catholic felt that way. Not every Polish person felt that way. So I wanted to write a family that, you know, loved their faith and was passionate about their faith and knew that that faith called them to help bring an end to these atrocities and to help their Jewish brothers and sisters. And so it was very important to me and very helpful in writing this book. Yeah. So a, a story I'm fond of telling and that I know I've told on this show before is of a man in the Louvre and the security guard sees this man and he's standing in front of a, I think it was a Picasso or something like that. And a security guard sees this guy take a paintbrush out and begin to touch up this Picasso painting. And they immediately uh, surrounded the guy. They pulled him away. They put him in the security. He had just vandalized this incredibly valuable painting. It was Picasso. <laughs> he wasn't finished with it. He kept oh looking at it and going, I'm, I, I, I need to finish this thing. It's right. not finished. When you've looked back over the book... Is there any place that you could metaphorically take a paintbrush and go, I wish I could do that differently? <laughs> I feel like there always is just because we're our own worst critics. Um, but honestly, for me, I haven't read the print version again, because I know if I see the words, I'm going to find something I want to change, a sentence I want to word differently. But I listen to the audiobook, which is narrated by Saskia Marleveld, who is absolutely fantastic. She was my favorite audio narrator long before I had any clue she was potentially going to narrate my book. And doing that, like I was not, I, my editing brain was not on listening to that book. She just took me right into the story, into the voices, into the accents, into the characters and the emotions and everything that was going on. And I just felt like I was listening as a reader, which was fantastic because I was so worried that I was going to listen to it and, again, just start editing things in my head. But I wanted to because I love this narrator so much and was so excited that we booked her. So audiobook, I think, is fine for me. I don't know if I will be able to read it, but um, listening to it was good. Yeah, you don't. You didn't feel the need to touch it up I as you not. listened to it. I did not. So are there parts of books or sentences, small parts in French, Yiddish, German, mm -hmm. English? Do you master any of these other languages? I do not. <laughs> so tell me how that, how do you got the correct wording and, and, and you know, uh, expressions, et cetera. I, I'm, yes. I'm guessing based on the amount of research that I've heard you've done, that no part of the French, Yiddish or German is incorrect and all this is spot on. Tell me about getting that content. So that was all uh, very interesting research. A lot of it, um, some of it came from survivor testimonies and things because they would, you know, insert words or phrases that I would then hear and kind of use because, uh, you know, they would say things like organize was a camp lingo term that I discovered from that research. And what they meant by that was if you organized something, that meant you stole it or you traded for it or you bartered for it or something. This was a term that the prisoners the would prisoners use. The prisoners used, yes. exactly. And so that was just interesting to me in terms of that language. And then the German words and things that were used in the camp to refer to prisoners 
or slurs for Jewish people or Polish people. All of that came from survivor testimonies. And then Yiddish and all of that as well. I found um, just a lot of different resources online with the languages, with the words and what they meant, with grammar, with things like that. I used good old fashioned Google Translate to listen to things. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so I didn't necessarily rely on it for authenticity's sake. but um, And then I um, had a good friend who is Jewish read the book and kind of tell me if all the Yiddish was used properly and things like that. And so I did try to kind of double check all the places that had other words that were not part of my vocabulary. Part of the surprising part of the book with, to me was the not the relationship between Maria and the young man. Yes. Mateusz. Ma, say that again. Mateusz. Mateusz, yes. which would be Matthew, I suspect, in my, in, in, your, in my English language. <laughs> but was the normalcy of life going on in and around Warsaw while a block down the road, a mile down the road, these horrific things were happening. And that there was the normalcy of life of people walking up to go into the bakery, mm-hmm. as, as, as a part of the book it occurs in a bakery, with ash falling from the sky. Mm-hmm. And the realization that those those ashes are people. Mm-hmm. What is your comment on, on, can you comment on that? Yes. So, yes. So for those who don't know, Auschwitz is situated outside of a little town in Poland called Oswinschen. And that Auschwitz is that name in German. That's the same place. That's just what the town is called. Just the camp itself was called Auschwitz. So the residents of Oswinschen were overtaken by the Nazis as well when they came in to, you know, take over this camp because Auschwitz, the main camp was originally a Polish army barracks. And so the Nazis took that over and then expanded it into Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the one you think of that has the railway and the big arch and all those, you know, giant gas chambers and things. So the residents of Oswinschim uh, were in town living their lives under Nazi occupation. So the Nazis did take over that bakery that's mentioned in the book. That was straight out of Wiltold Poletsky's report. So Poletsky was a Polish officer who allowed himself to be captured so he could go to Auschwitz to organize the resistance movement. And they would often have prisoners occasionally work alongside civilians in situations like this. So since the Nazis took over that that bakery, they would have prisoners come in to do all the manual labor while the residents did the baking and just, you know, the normal everyday stuff, whereas the prisoners did the heavy lifting. So that was all straight out of testimonies and research. But yes, the people outside of the camp were not allowed near the camp. They would smell things that were burning, see this ash in the sky and want to know what was going on, try to find out what was going on. But they were not told unless they heard from a prisoner. But the guards did not tell them we're burning corpses and that's what you're smelling. So, um, yeah, the guards didn't say that. I'm wondering, uh, what is your... So you you took a deep dive into the darker part of humanity. Yes. And it, it's a wonderful tale. Uh, and I'm not going to give any part of it away, but you took a deep dive, Gabriella, into a dark part of humanity uh, that's thoroughly documented. What do you think about people? I mean, you, you've earned the right to have an opinion <laughs> about this because you, you've, you've studied so many of them so much in detail. Mm-hmm. You got deep into the weeds, into what happened in these concentration camps. What do you think about people? Well, I think the message that I really wanted to portray in this book was at its heart that even when there is all this horror going on and things like one ideology become so prominent and so prevalent and just so twisted, there are still going to be good people in those situations, in those environments, trying to fight against it and to join together to overcome it. So I feel in terms of the Nazi regime in particular, that was very heavily propagated by propaganda and brainwashing and all these things. Like there were normal German people and everyday people who didn't really know what was going on, but they agreed, you know, with certain aspects of, you know, the Nazi party or whatever, or were not completely told everything. And the Nazis were not necessarily honest about everything that was happening. So I think situations like this can show how influential and persuasive people can be and how you can manipulate certain ideas and certain things to influence people in those ways when you get a few diabolical people in power, such as Hitler and people like him. And this is the kind of damage that they can do 
But the core of humanity, I do still feel is good at heart and is seeking that goodness and will eventually and ultimately overcome all the evil. We'd like to think so. Yes. I, I've, people have said to me, not in our conversation or preparing for our conversation, like nothing like that could ever happen again. I think it can. Absolutely. I think there's an element of humanity that could facilitate this oh, if we don't stay vigilant. Exactly. And, and I sure there are people out there listening going, heck, it has. There have been places right. in Africa where things of this nature have gone on and we've turned a, a willful blind eye to it. Right. So one of the things that's an element throughout the novel is these touches of hope. That's mm -hmm. one of the things my wife has taken away Good. of these small raindrops, teardrops mm -hmm. of hope that show up in there throughout. Tell me about that. So that was very important to me. There's um, a point Maria makes in the book about how you had to find a balance between recognizing your reality and being hopeful, but not being too hopeful. Because if they got to a point where they were hopeless, then you wouldn't survive. You had to have something to cling to and to live for and to fight for to survive this experience. But on the other hand, if you had this warped perception of your situation and of how hopeful you could actually be, that was also detrimental. So you, it was a very fine line between the two. So and for a lot of prisoners, that meant, you know, turning things off emotionally. You had to detach from what was going on while clinging to whatever it was you were fighting for. So like for Maria, it's fighting for justice. For Hanya, it's fighting to get back to her children who were taken out of the Warsaw ghetto. So everybody needed that. But then you also needed these people to cling to. So if you had a friend or a loved one that you could help support through this journey and through this process, you could get through it together. And that was so important. And these moments of hope were so important for them because it just kept them going. Because like I said, without it, they would have died because you needed that. That sustained you as much as food did. So it was very important to me to insert these moments of hope and of levity and of light and of goodness and of them bonding and just having these moments outside of all this horror that's going on around them to keep that hope alive. Uh, what's your next test? I think writing a novel had you, the first <laughs> test was completing this thing. And yes. then perhaps, and I'm hypothesizing here, completing it, then getting representation, somebody yes. that would be, read your proposal. Yes. And then it was, you know, getting an offer, mm -hmm. all kinds of little tests. That, now that you're on the other side of those tests, <laughs> what's the next test for yourself as a, as a writer? Oh, goodness. That is a good question. I would say just um, continuing and hopefully continuing to uncover these little tidbits of history that maybe haven't been discussed in much of a sense or in a fictional sense or most people might not know about. And bringing these important topics and messages to light and engaging readers and giving readers something that's going to make them think and help them connect to and maybe touch them emotionally and hopefully continue to satisfy them just in terms of as a good read. So I think that is kind of the challenge that I feel like I'm facing now because I want to continue doing this and continue writing novels and hopefully giving people good stories that are going to resonate with them and mean something. I got off the plane in LaGuardia many years ago, and I recognized Pat Conroy at the oh, uh, wow. luggage carousel. And I walked up to him, and his agent or somebody was was there to pick mm -hmm. him up, and I went up and I introduced myself. And he looked up, and you could tell that things like that had happened before. Mm -hmm. The people recognized him and, and wanted to shake his hand because of the books that he's written. Are you prepared for this? <laughs> I don't know if I'll get to that level, but I don't no, I guess so. Um, I really do love connecting with readers and talking to people and hearing from them, whether they reach out to me through my website contact form or write a review and talk about, you know, what parts of the book have, you know, resonated with them or meant something to them or if I see them at a book signing. And so I am very, very excited for that and to just continue engaging with readers. And because I know what that's like, I have been the fangirl at the author event so many times. And I love getting to meet those people who wrote this book that meant a lot to me or that got me through a tough part of my life or an important part of my life or something. And so I think it's a very intimate personal thing to write a book and to have people read it and have them feel connected to you in that way and be comfortable enough to tell you that like you we were talking about uh, before this interview people have shared things with me already that are very very personal to them in ways that the book has influenced them or reminded them of something in their life or an experience that they had or a real experience that they've had with 
someone who survived the Holocaust or something that this book, you know, evoked those memories. And so it's very, very humbling and such an honor to have people share those kinds of things with me. You have, through this book, become an important part of some people's lives who, who this has triggered some memories. This has triggered some uh, some therapy. Mm -hmm. This is a catharsis, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I can relate a little bit through this show. I have people that walk up and introduce themselves to me and share things to me or tell me stories like we've been friends for years. Oh, and yeah. I have no idea who they are. <laughs> but through this broadcast, they've heard me many times. You're going to you're experiencing the same thing. You told me people are sending you stories and you're going, gosh, I don't even know this person. Right. And this is a very personal story that it's they're amazing. telling me. I had the other day someone from Canada sent me a message and said, I haven't picked up a book for pleasure in 15 or more years. I was at Costco, decided I you know, wanted to get into reading again, browse the selection. Nothing really caught my eye, came back after doing all my shopping to try to give it one more shot, saw your book, picked it up. I loved it. I am recommending it to everyone I know. And now I'm so excited about reading again. So just to reignite that passion for one person is just, you know, incredible. You taught a pure class, a bar class, I'm yes. sorry, at yes. 530 a.m. today. I did. Do any of the people in your class get this? They do. They have been the most fantastic, supportive people. Um, so I've worked at Pure Bar ever since I started this book. So some of those people who've been there for a few years knew me when I was, you know, sitting on the floor between classes, drafting or researching or reading fiction and, you know, all these things. So they know I've been working on this uh, for a long time. And so many of them have bought my book and have bought it for friends and bought it for Christmas presents. And now, like so many of us talk about what we're reading and talk about books and their book clubs. And so we'll share books and we'll recommend books to each other. And so it's become such a bonding thing for all of us. And I am just so grateful to have such a great group of women and everyone, um, because it's very much evocative of kind of the themes in the story of just that power of female friendship is something I wanted to capture and in this book. And, you know, I have no better example of it in my life than the way all these women at Pure Bar have supported me and my love and my passion for this and have cheered alongside me and championed it with me. And it's just been absolutely amazing. That's good to hear. They yeah. know who they're, they know who's in their <laughs> midst and they've seen the production and, and they've been a part of it in absolutely. a small way along the way. Absolutely. Do you have any theories and we'll wrap this thing up here. Do you have any theories about Southern storytellers? People down in the South tend to pride themselves as storytellers. Do you think there's anything to that? I think so. I think it's something that you know, every family in the South has in their life in some way, whether it was, you know, bedtime stories that your grandparents told you or, you know, sitting around, you know, during the holidays sharing stories or traditions or things. I feel like it's a very big part of the Southern culture and very personal to a lot of us and to how tight knit a lot of these families are, because, you know, a lot of them in the South and I guess everywhere, but especially here, there are, you know, families who have lived in these places for generations or in we have all these old historic homes and all these places that just are stories in and of themselves. And so I think that is just so amazing that it's such a big part of our culture and our lives and something that bonds people because, you know, whether or not you can read or write or do anything, most people can tell a story or can sit and, you know, gather around a campfire and listen to one. And so I just think it's something that can bond people no matter who you are, or where you come from. We've got Winston Groom, a local boy, passed away now. Yeah. we got Watt Key, who's done very well in the writing world. There are probably many that I'm overlooking. Even Jimmy Buffett has written a couple yeah. of books that have sold a lot of copies. There's a home on Spring Hill Avenue, on the north side of Spring Hill Avenue, that was owned by the, a, a female writer back in the day, like the 1800s. She mm -hmm. was extraordinarily a, a million bestseller in that time. is pretty big deal. Absolutely. I can't think of her name right now. Are you prepared to be you know, in that crowd? <laughs> I would love to be. I would be, you know, honored to have a seat at that table. But um, I don't know. I don't. It's really just kind of one day at a time for me and just kind of see what happens and where this goes. And I'm just as long as I can hopefully continue doing it. That is the best thing I could ever hope for. Folks, I've got her book in front of me. The last checkmate, Gabriella Saab. I'm going to have her sign it. It's going to be the <laughs> highlight of my day. No doubt about it. And um I think you kick ass. Since this is the <laughs> podcast version, I think you kick ass. And well, I'm glad you. to know you. 
I am so glad to know you too. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. All right. That's the end of the podcast version, folks. We'll have another Words Working broadcast for you next week. Have a good week. Have a good week.